I have concluded, this is personal, personal observation, personal conclusion. I have concluded after many years of association with Adventist Christians and Christians of other faiths, etc., I have concluded that many people do not understand the continuum of prophecy. Something that began there is outlined here and here. This is how this is played out if you don't understand what this continuum is. The book of Daniel has 12 chapters. Now what the pioneers of the Advent movement did is what Christians of many other denominations have done for centuries, long before we came along in the 1800s. You take one part of a continuum and you separate it from everything else. You can even take one verse unto 2,300 years. It doesn't say years. Well, it says days, and a day is equal to a year. It doesn't even say days. Do you understand? They don't. They don't understand what they are doing. Steering themselves down an incorrect path. It does not say years, and it does not say days. It says 2300 evening morning. And it's in there for a reason. A reason that will not be fully comprehended until the end. So I, I, I look at the pioneers and the forefathers with a great appreciation. I do. Someone sacrificed back there, printed a great controversy for me to find. And I'm where I am because of their faith and foresight and sacrifice. But they did not have all the answers. And then when the history began to break out that all down through 150 years we have had Adventist ministers and evangelists who have gone to the Word, studied the Word, and said, folk, we've got to come up to the light. We are not walking and teaching in harmony with Scripture. And we ran them out of town on a railroad. We tarred and feathered them. We threw them out. I don't know why I should not understand all of that because that's what they did with Jesus. That's what they did with the apostles. That's what they did with the prophets. That's the way the church always behaves. Always. There should be no surprises in all of that. When I became an Adventist Christian, I wanted to go give Bible studies. I gave a many a Bible study on Daniel chapter 2 and the metallic image and all the rest of it. And then when I matured in my Christian walk and I matured in my schooling as a ministerial candidate, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, as I began to learn more, understand more, I decided to read the book of Daniel again. You listening? I was still in college. I was a senior. It was my senior year. I had tried for four years to take the course in Daniel and Revelation. Oh, you can't take that in your, in your first year. You can't take that in your second year. It's an upper division course. Okay, I'm a junior. I want to take Daniel and Revelation. Sorry, we don't teach that but every other year. Are you listening to this? So I, I get to my senior year to take a course in Daniel and Revelation. By then, I'm somewhat educated enough to ask some intelligent questions. And so in the class, we're given a chapter in Daniel. And then we come to class and we discuss it. And more than a few times, I said to the good teacher and a fine man, I said, Elder, why do we teach it this way? This is not what it says. I know, Brother Charles, but we have been promised more light to come. Well, maybe it's time for the more light. Try it. Just remember, you've got a big bullseye there. Just remember. So what we have done, not only Adventists, but what Christians have done, is we take 
and we, we just break it into pieces. Sometimes we break it into pieces like, well, the vision of Daniel 7. Well, the vision of Daniel 7 is comprehensive. Well, what does that mean? It means it takes in everything from here to here. And from here is the beginning of the end and the end of the end. Read it. That's Daniel's first vision. It's comprehensive. And each vision that follows is an enlargement upon this vision. This book is not to be torn into pieces and let's work out, well, um, the Old and New Testaments were the two witnesses thrown down in the streets for three and a half years. You know. It doesn't say that. You go back and check out, well, where did it come from? It came from Isaac Newton, Sir Isaac Newton, who was studying the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, Daniel in particular, and he said, well, we've got to figure this out because Jesus can't come and the world can't end until we got it figured out, so let's figure it out. Let's work it out. Good man. But it wasn't the end. No, 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 no. By and by on the screen, you're going to see some things that it took me years and years and years to get past. I've got to get past this. I've got to understand what is actually, what is this daily that is taken away? What is this abomination that makes desolate that's going to be set up? Well, I've listened to sermons. I've given a few myself, but no, no, no. There are things there that just, they don't add up. But when they do, wow. Wow. So what I'm begging of you and anyone who may see and hear what we're talking about here is understand that there, there, there is a continuum in all of this. And this is an enlargement of this. And this is an enlargement of this. And this is an enlargement of this. And this. Right here. Right here. We need to understand what heaven is doing. Now. I posed this question a little bit earlier. But we need to pose it again. This is about 50 by 90 miles. 50 miles wide, 90 miles long. Um, that's not much larger than the county I live in. Everything in this book, everything in this book, and the characters in this book, took place in this little piece of real estate. Now wait a minute. When Jesus came 2,000 years ago, where did he show up? Now Jesus lived for at least 33 years. He should have been well traveled in 33 years. How far did he travel? But this is a big world. There are lots of people. Uh, the, the, everybody needs to know that God is doing something. Why does God do it this way? He leaves us all in the dark. You won't buy that? Jesus is going to come after 4,000 years. After 1,500 years of Jews, believers who have cried and cried and prayed and prayed, where is the promise of his coming? And so he comes. Finally, he comes. Who got the announcement? Come on, who got the announcement? Probably illiterate. We could call them all kinds of unsavory things like goat tenders. Now just a moment. This 
is the most important moment in all of human history. And you're going to announce it where? You're going to announce it to whom? Why does God do things this way? If you haven't satisfied your mind along those lines, you need to get down and do some serious studying, my friend. Everything in that book and all the prophecies, this, this is a Jewish book written by Jews to Jews about Jews. And all of the prophecies in this book are based upon Jerusalem, time and place. If you have other nations mentioned or included in some of the prophecies of this book, it is only because they, ha they have some impact on this piece of real estate. Well, what about the mark of the beast, Brother Wheeling? Yes. Who is going to propose to the whole world that they make an image to the first beast? That they make another image? a larger image, a better image to the first beast. Who is going to propose that? It's called the little horn who is going to seat himself here. We need a larger vision. You and I need a larger understanding of what is going on. God is playing out the entire plan of salvation in this little piece of real estate, which is a stand-in, a substitute for the whole intelligent creation. So this is where we need to talk, you and I. This trouble, this rebellion began where? Come on, don't say the garden. Up there. Up there. The Garden of Eden is recognized in Scripture as Eden, the garden of God. So the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man to tend the garden. And on and on we go. When Adam and Eve made their mistake, they were put out of the Was the garden still there? Yes. Was the garden still there for quite a while? Yes. If you read Ellen White, it was there until the flood, and it was removed. This would suggest that it was in heaven and brought here, and it is taken back to heaven so it can be brought back here. Are you listening? Well, I've never seen a flying garden. Well, maybe one day you'll have the privilege. Hopefully. Is there anything in Scripture, if we do our homework, is there anything in Scripture to suggest that the garden was there before it got here? Thou wast in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. Thou didst walk up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. The garden was there. It was a wedding present. It was a wedding gift to our daddy and mama. You can't do better than God planting a garden. Right? Right. This book opens with in a garden, out of a garden, and it closes with in a garden again. Not a garden, the garden. It is the property, the express, the personal property of God. I have to put you out. They were permitted, even the scripture suggests that they were permitted to come to the gates of the garden, come to the garden, but not permitted to go in. For the Lord God put an angel there with a fire, a flaming sword to bar the way. Okay? I have to put you out. But I'm promising you before I put you out that I'm going to get you back home. That's Genesis 3.15.
Now, they might have asked, well, how long is this going to take? This is something you and I need to think through besides the human part of this, this experience, this story, this record, is you have worlds of intelligent beings. And they are watching this squabble in Washington, D.C. They're listening to the hot rhetoric. If you take Ellen White, worth anything on this point, she says, it came to the place where 50, fully 50% 50 or fully half the angels were siding with Lucifer. And he looked abroad over his army and he said, we're strong enough now to take the throne by force. The Bible says there was war in heaven. I don't know how they fight. Swords of fire somehow. There was war in heaven and the dragon fought and Michael fought. And the devil was cast out. Now I'm on one of these worlds and I'm watching all of this and I'm thinking to myself, why doesn't God just put an end to this right now? That would be reasonable. We already see the hurt and the harm that has come into heaven itself. Why doesn't God just step in and do what only God can do and put an end to this right now? No answer. No answer. I don't know how long from that rebellion and war in heaven till he got here. I'm sure he went knocking on lots of doors. But we were brand spanking new. We didn't know how to count. And he got here. And all of these worlds are watching, watching with intense interest. And they see the devil put on this charade, pretend to be, and he has deceived and lied his way into God's garden. But now there are innocents, innocents, who are going to be harmed. And nobody yet understood what that harm was. It's called death. But it didn't come instantly. But they're watching all of this. They're hearing all of this. And they are saying and asking among themselves, if God had just done something when he could have done something, all of this would have been avoided. And so we watch the world turn to, to rot, rot and ruin. And they're watching the news every night for several thousand earth years. They're watching it. And they're saying among themselves, is this ever going to end? I just don't get it. Do you get it? Do you understand why God who has the power and the authority, why he doesn't? Silence in heaven. Silence in heaven. Then Jesus shows up down here. Ah, at last. And then we see him beaten, spit upon, rejected by his own people. And these wandering worlds are just, they're like, And they're posing the same questions the disciples asked Jesus after his resurrection. Lord, wilt thou at this time restore the kingdom? Didn't do it. Nobody down here and no one up there knew another 2,000 miserable years would pass. And one day there's an announcement that's posted on all the bulletin boards in heaven. It's published in all the newspapers on all those worlds. You are to be present on the day of and at this address. Ooh, I wonder what this is all about. The, the phones are hot and heavy. And what will be the purpose of the judgment? You tell me, what would be the purpose of the judgment? 
prove Jesus is right. Okay, to prove Jesus is right or righteous. I'll buy that. But there's something larger going on. And here it is. Please listen. And the Lord God took dust and made man. Breathed into him the breath of life. And the man stands up. He's not a babe. He's not going through the birth process as you and I have done. He stands up. He is fully, he is a grown man. What is he lacking? Two things. Come on. Experience and a wife, which gave him plenty of experience. <laughs> Are you listening? He may be a grown man like those grown trees that God raised up in the first six days and grown animals in the field and so forth. He's a grown being. He is a mature being. But what is he here? He's a babe. And God allowed the devil to take advantage of him. Now, if you want to play this out in the New Testament, Jesus gives one of his very famous parables, and he says, uh, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And uh, by and by, the seed was sprung up. And with the wheat, there were tares. In the South, it's spelled W E E D S. Weeds. There were tares. So his servants came to him, worlds. His servants came to him and they said, didn't you plant good seed, clean seed? Yes. Where did the tares come from? An enemy has done. Oh, they said, let's go and do what? Let's take care of business. Let's take care of business. And the master said, uh, no. Yes, but we're going to pull them up. No, you're not. You're going to let the weeds and the wheat grow together. Now, let me tell you, in the South, we know what weeds are. We have super weeds in the South. We have 26% of all the water that falls on North America flows through Alabama. We have got super weeds in the South. And I'll tell you how it is. The day before I left to come out here, I planted some things in my grow bed. I planted some things in my garden. So that while I'm out here with you, things can be growing. Now when I get back, what do you suppose I'm going to see tallest? So I have listened to this and I've read this parable and I've said, uh-uh, poor gardening practice. No, 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 no. See a weed, pull it up. Take care of business. Because if you don't, what takes over? The weeds take over. What is God doing? Let me ask you this. Have the weeds taken over? Yes. What is God doing? Look, folk. Try this one on. Everything that God does, he does not need to take back. Everything that God says stands for how long? Forever. God never created the situation that you and I are in and heaven fell into. God did not create that. Well, he created everything. Yes, but he created them and he created us free beings. Free. Free. It's the only way you can ever engender 
love. Love cannot be commanded. And thou art commanded to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. No, 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 no. No, you can't command love. Well, that's what it says. Yes, that's the way it's supposed to be, but isn't. You cannot command love. You cannot demand love. Love is free expression. And so God could have taken care of business back there, but for the rest of eternity, all of the children who are supposed to love him would do what instead? Fear him. Oh, you would think they would respect him because he took care of... No, 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 no. No, 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 no. That's not how it works. God is too wise. So this continuum here is God working out something. The plan of, come on, salvation. Now what salvation means, deliverance from something. Come on, Egyptian bondage. The bondage of sin. So how does that take place? Uh, God just comes down here and gets us and we're delivered out of sin. No, 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 no. Before we are taken out of here, something has to be taken out of here. Come on. The days are coming, says the Lord. I will give them a new heart and a new mind. Okay? That happens this side of our journey through Orion. It doesn't happen on the other side. It happens this side. Now let me ask you. This is serious business we're talking about. Let me ask you. I am not perfect. Yet. <laughs> I am not perfect. And no one knows better than I, except the good Lord, that I am not perfect. I am no paragon of virtue. I do not look in the mirror and smile. I look in the mirror and frown. Now, any preacher or evangelist who wants to come along and quote me scripture and tell me what I must be before I can get to heaven, and this is where the pioneers blew it. You forgive me, but this is where they blew it. The Bible speaks very clearly of a judgment to come. An investigative judgment. But who is investigated? The Advent pioneers. God is going to investigate us. And every sin we've ever committed and every word we've ever, everything we've ever done, we're all going to stand before the judgment bar of God and we're going to give an answer. It's absolutely true. That's what the scripture says, and it's absolutely true that that's what's going to happen. But according to scripture and according to the sanctuary, we don't go inside the sanctuary. The people stay out here. Who goes in? Come on, who goes in? On the day of judgment, who and who alone goes in? The great high priest. Is there anything in New Testament scripture that tells us who that is? There is an investigative judgment. It starts when you just enter the sanctuary. Bring a lamb. And the priest has to investigate the lamb to see that he's without blemish. And then he has to give his blood. When this judgment is called into session, who is going to be judged? Chapter 4, book of Revelation, the one sitting on the throne before Jesus ever gets in the door of the judgment to come, the Father is the first one to face judgment. Check it out. Amen. Check it out. And the declaration with great shouts in heaven is worthy, worthy is the one on the throne to receive glory, honor, majesty, power, authority. All these things are given to him. Nothing else happens in the judgment until he is voted in. Well, God doesn't need anybody's vote. No, he doesn't. But he says, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly. So Jesus comes in. 
And here's heaven assembled. And what is their declaration? Worthy, worthy is the Lamb. Why is he worthy? Why is he declared worthy? Worthy, worthy is the Lamb that was to receive. So what is happening is when the judgment is called into session here, a vote is taken first for the one on the throne, and then a vote is taken for the Lamb. How do you and I get into this picture? Come on. In him. Through him. When does he become your substitute and mine? I'm talking about at the personal level. When does he become my judge? My priest? My what? When I recognize him and I say I want him to represent me. Depends. I want him to be my representative in the court of heaven. And he does so. And he is equipped to do so. He has no sin against him. Well, what about me? I have nothing but sin against me. Nothing. I have nothing good to offer. Thank heaven that heaven is not looking to me to pay the price. So Jesus has paid the price, and he says, my blood. Now, what happens when he exits the judgment? Tell me what happens as he exits the judgment. And by the way, the disciples, and especially Peter, thought all of this was happening on the day of Pentecost. Come on. What has... Repent, every one of you, Peter preached in Jerusalem. Repent, every one of you, that your sins may be what? Blotted out. When the times of? That's the baptism of fire. Are you listening? I just gave you a clue as to which one of the sanctuary moed Jesus will return. Repent, every one of you, that your sins may be what? Blotted out. What happens to my sins? Come on. They are blotted out. What does that mean? I will cast them into the depths of the sea to be remembered what? Will that be heaven? Does it happen at the end of the thousand years or before the thousand years? It has to be before. Because I'm going to be in heaven for a thousand years. And my misery and my rot and my sin is not going through the gate. So I have to be made brand new. The purpose of the judgment is to grant God and His Son the rightful, lawful authority to make me brand new. Amen. That's it. In a nutshell, you want to talk about the planets? That is the plan. Is to treat me, not simply treat me as though I had never sinned, make me as though I have never sinned. If you think I'm going to heaven and be looking over my shoulder to see if you know who I am, no way. I don't have to look over my shoulder again. And neither do you. All of this is a big deal. This is a big price. How expensive is this? It costs the blood of God. You can't, you can't write a check bigger than that one. You can't do it. Now, this continuum that we're talking about, is God through the prophets showing us how these last few years, which include judgment, how these last few years are going to be played out down here. So I'll say this very quickly. You have Daniel, you have John, the revelator. In the book of Daniel, the prophecies are telling you about earthly powers. It's, it's a vision of what takes place down here in the time of the end. 
when John comes along, he is given visions of what takes place up there in the time of the end. So you and I are able, with the help of the Spirit and the aid of Scripture, you and I are able to get the larger picture. And the vote that is going to be taken up there is mirrored by the vote that's going to be taken down here. What say ye up there? Will you have this man to reign over you? Or do you want Barabbas? And while the vote is being taken up there, a vote is being taken down here. And who are you voting for? The guy who says he's Christ, the guy who says he's God, the guy who says, just listen to me and do what I say, and all will be well. You and I are going to cast a vote down here. And what is it going to cost you? What is it going to cost you? Everything. Well, I thought Jesus paid it all. Do you understand what faith really is? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. The word faith means waiting on God. Do we wait on God or do we wait with God? Yes, it, we wait with God. Absolutely. For many, many years of my Christian experience, I thought, we're waiting on God. When is God going to do something? Why doesn't God do something? The world just has to end. It can't get worse. No, 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 no. The reality in all of this is that we wait with God. The Spanish word for faith is to wait. So you and I become uh, how can we become joint heirs if we don't become So in the end, you're going to be my witnesses, says the Lord. You're going to be my witnesses. You're going to have a bullseye on your back too. I'm sorry it's this way, but it has to be this way. So here we are after several thousand years of misery, misery, misery on this rock. We are about as worthless as we can get or become and heaven is going to look down and ask you and me to stand up be brave be counted and lay down our lives if necessary and I submit to you that we're not going to be able to fit into that picture unless we fall in love with God you, you, you have to come you have to come to the place that you, you understand that the great God the great God of glory and majesty and power has humbled himself and lowered himself and come down here and if you do if you really come to understand how great a price God has paid for what reason? Because he, for God so what the world? Now, having said this, I want to give you a brief recess. Very brief. And we're going to open some things on the screen here and I'm going to take you into Daniel chapter 8. Please listen. We're not dealing with the ram and the he-goat. We're not, that's not what we're looking at. We're going to look at Daniel 8, and we're just looking at four verses, 9 through 13. And they are right square in the middle of this continuum that I keep talking about. And what we're going to do is we're going to put on the screen what those verses say in the King James. And then we're going to highlight the words that are italicized in those verses. Because the words that are italicized were supplied by the, come on, the translators. 
and they don't belong to the passages. Now the pioneers didn't really understand that very well and so they bought into some things. And so you and I are going to be looking at some things and we're going to go back to 1980, 1980, not 1880, 1980. And a meeting that took place 